office of God today. There's no place you'd want to you'd want to either be. It's really good to be here, and, and I want to thank the church and Pastor Trail, even though he's not here, for the chance to minister. It's always great. I enjoy it. it makes me excited. I mean, I might be a little bit nervous, but God is good, and He'll do what He will. Amen. Amen. If we could all stand, we're going to turn to turn to Matthew chapter six, starting at verse twenty-four. Should appear on the way down. <clears throat> God has been working on me this week. Uh, he plopped this into my head here on about Wednesday. But, and yeah, I'm going to go with it. <laughs> Matthew 6, starting up chapter 6 and verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Um, Brother Porter, if you could pray over the service tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Thank God, you, we pray that you touch your word, Lord, Lord, that your word be quickened. God, I pray to our hearts and souls as we receive your engrafted word, God. We pray, God, touch our brother as he ministers your word today, Lord, and help us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated tonight. I'm going to switch over to the white thing there, Mr. Tim. Hello, okay. (laughs) We live in turbulent times. From from suicide bombings bombings to massive shootings, we see this happening all over the world. In England, in in, in the Middle East, it's it's everywhere. We are witnessing the earth and all of its greatness. It's falling apart. But I want to ask you a question. What do the children of God do? What are we doing? And what have we done? Um, This generation, I find, my generation, we have chosen to set aside the Bible ways and have embraced complacency. Most of us have. There's a large number of this generation that has done that. This generation has forgotten about prayer. I mean, you can tell that. Being holy, uh, (laughs) we live in one of the most unholiest times there can be. There's just so much filth in this world. And fasting. That's one of the things I, I find my generation that we have fallen short on. Like it's been a while since you've ever heard of like of our generation fasting, like calling a, a having a calling a like calling a fast that we should all just fast about things. But we are taking my generation. We are taking everything for granted, and we have forgot and we have chosen to forget to forget who we are. In First Peter two and nine, I want to remind us who we are. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are a chosen people. But that's not enough just to be a chosen people. We have to make the choice that we are, that we have to choose that we are the chosen people. We have to make that choice. All that we have is a bunch of potential, but we have to choose that we are a chosen people. This world has been rotting and has, be, has be, been decaying for quite a long time. We are the salt of this earth in Matthew 5 and 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of man. We cannot lose our saltiness. The thing that sets us aside from the blandness and the corruptness and the corruption of this world. We can't lose our fire, that anointing, that Holy Ghost fire to do the work of God and to reach out to this lost, lost and weary world. We have choices. We have, to choo- we, have, we have to choose the choices, and we, we have to make the right choices. And we cannot serve God and mammon. We have to choose. That is our choice now in, in this generation, in this time, Right now, we have to choose who we are going to serve. You can't serve God and another. You cannot sit on a fence. There is no fence. There's no such thing as a fence. There's just a line. It's either you're past the line on God's side or you're on the other side with the devil. That's it. If we are to make a difference in this world, our mind has to be made up. In James 1 and 8, this talks about a double-minded man. A double-minded man is unstable in his ways. We can see that. I work... 
I don't, I, my boss, he's, sometimes he's really confusing. I work at jacking up houses. I'm, I'm, I end up all over the place. I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, it's really confusing. And, yeah, and he gets lost too sometimes. But it's, it's dangerous to be unstable. Like, we got to, <laughs> we got to have our head on straight and have things organized and know what we're doing. We need to make up our mind today, and we need to choose he, who we will serve. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is our choices that we should make. I, God gave me three choices. I believe he gave me three choices when I was praying. And the, the three choices are we have to choose to lead, we have a choice to lead, we have a choice to stand, and we have a choice to serve. I'm going to talk about those tonight. So first off, we need to choose to lead. In Exodus 3 and 11 and 12, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, this is God, I will, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. This is at the burning bush. Moses and God are, are having a little talk here. God wants Moses to lead his people out of bondage, out of Egypt. Continuing on to the next three verses, Exodus 13 to 14. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. You can see Moses is trying to wiggle out of this. He doesn't want the responsibility to lead the people out of Egypt, out of bondage. Reading down Exodus chapter 4, they, they converse like two chapters. In Exodus 4 and 10 to 11. And Moses said unto, unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, unto him who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Just like Moses, God has called us, called each and every one of us, to show the people the promised land, to show people Jesus. At first, Moses didn't want to lead the children of Israel. Most people don't want to lead. It's a big responsibility. But as the children of God, and like we've been chosen, and we need to choose if we're chosen, and we need to choose to lead. It's a big responsibility, but we have to choose. You might have failures. You might have a speech problem. You might have a past, but let me read you a scripture in 1 Corinthians 1 and 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Even in your weakness, that's where God is strongest. God will pull you through. You have to have the faith that even in your weakness, God is still there. And he's going to make you strong. After, after Moses finished giving all of his weaknesses to God, God gave him all the answers. For whatever problem Moses spouted out to God, God always gave him a response back that I can do this. That God will do this for him. But in the end, Moses now had a choice. He had a choice either to choose to lead or not to lead them. It was Moses' choice. God asked him. God didn't tell him. God asked him. He didn't know what was going to happen, but Moses stepped out. And we need, to, we need to choose to be leaders today in our homes, our work, to our friends, and in our whole lives. Like, we need to choose to be that, the leaders. You never know who you might help lead to Christ. That's what we're supposed to do, lead people to Christ. Just like Moses, Moses only led the children of Israel so far. They had to choose to go over to the promised land. And people who we showed Jesus, they, they have to choose either if they want Jesus or if they don't. It is their choice. But we still have to show them. This world with all of its sins and false relig religions, it's leading its people to hell. It's leading the people around us, our friends who aren't saved, it's leading them to hell. And what it needs, what this world needs, is a born-again believer to lead them to Jesus. That's what this world needs. It needs you and I to step out, to be leaders, 
and to show them Jesus. Turning to Matthew chapter 5, reading verses 14 to 16. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before man that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We are the light of the world. We know the way to Jesus. We know salvation. We know the gospel. And why should we take a back seat and let people, fig- and let people try and figure it out for themselves? Why take a back seat? That's not how it's supposed to be. It's not. We have the truth that will set them free from their addictions, from their bondage, and from their circumstances. We're around broken people every day. We see them, but we just don't reach out. Why keep quiet? For too long we have been withholding the gospel of Jesus, the good news of what he can do for them. Like the saying goes, you might be the only Bible somebody will ever read. We need to choose to, st- choose to lead. Amen. Secondly, we need to choose to stand. In Daniel 3, verses 1 to 6, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers. Uh, yeah, so they came. I just repeated. Sorry. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all the kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace. Reading down to Daniel, uh, moving down to verse 8. Wherefore, at the time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. And that was Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And, yeah, they chose not to bow down. I was talking about Nebuchadnezzar. He built an image, an idol. He wanted all the people, all of the governors, all the people in power, that they would bow down and worship this idol. But there was three, three men who stood up. And that, who, who, st- who stayed standing. That was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew that was going to happen if they stood up. They were going to be cast into the fiery furnace. That was the decree from the king. And these Chaldeans, they went and they told on them. And there's going to be people who are just going to criticize you for standing for Jesus. For standing for God, they're going to reach out and they're going to try and criticize you and tear you down. Yeah, they, they refused and they were tossed into the fiery furnace. They refused to bow down. They chose to stand. And moving on to verses 23 to 26. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound to the midst of the, of, of the burning fiery furnace. So they're getting thrown to the fire. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound to the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. These men, they chose to stand against the king's decree. It was death if they, they defied it, and it was death. They knew that if they, that if they did stand, they would be tossed into this furnace, but they stood into it anyway. This world wants us to bow down and accept its laws, its abominations, and its wickedness. It puts that image right in front of our faces every single day, and it wants us to bow down to it. As the children of God, as his chosen people, we need to choose to stand. Even if all of our, if, even if all of our peers our friends, our families, even if they bow down, we must choose to stand. Their friends probably urged them to bow down. Like, they're probably like, hey, like, bow down. Like, you know what's going to happen to you? However, these men, they knew what would happen. 
but they would stand for God. That was their choice. They were not about to make a compromise. They weren't about to bow down towards this image of falseness. How many of us today would be willing to risk our lives like that today? It's a question. Like it's, it's a hard question to answer. But how many would stand for Jesus and how many would fall down and bow? Stand for what the scriptures say, even if it might get us killed. Like we see that over in the in the Middle East with ISIS. I mean, they're beheading people left and right, like Christians left and right. Like, would would you would you be beheaded for Christ? Would you die? <clears throat> I don't want to be, and I hope you don't want to be a wishy washy Christian who doesn't believe in anything and can be easily swayed by this world any of its things, like there's the homosexual Bible out now, I don't know if you guys know about this, but it's like pro-homosexual, but I mean in my Bible it says it's an abomination and it's wrong and it's a sin, so it, it's a sin, like I'm not going to fall for that idol, for that that false teaching, like no, like if it's if, if it's in our Bible and it says it's wrong, then it's wrong, I mean it, it's, it's wrong, there's no way you can go around it, you can't, God's not going to accept it. If it's unholy, it's unholy. If it's unholy in the Bible, then it's unholy in our lives. I want to be able to stand with a boldness proclaiming who Jesus is. It might not be the most popular decision in the world, but it's time we took a, we took a stand against the world as Christians. It's time Christianity, like born-again believers, that we stand. That we stand against all this corruptness, all of this garbage that's trying to push us down. It's time to push back. It keeps trying to push the church to be more accepting, as I said, of homosexuality. And it says all religions are a pathway to God. But they're all lies and false teachings full of false teachers and false messiahs and false everything. It's a lie. And it's from the pit of hell. I mean, it's, it's a lie. Allah doesn't save. Confucius can't help. Buddha is just an idol. All these are religions. They are lies. But Jesus saves. There is only one God that came down as a man to die for everyone's sins, and his name is Jesus. It was no other man, it was no, it was no, it was no one else, it was God. He came by himself and he did it. Amen. I'm done sitting back. I want to stand and proclaim who Jesus is. In Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in, other na- in any other name, where there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. This is the truth that I will stand, for Jesus is our only salvation. The enemy will threaten you with everything it can throw at you, from being disowned to being thrown into a fiery furnace. You must remember that you are never alone. Jesus will stand up for his own name if nobody else will stand. He'll do it himself. Man, but you, but yeah, you must remember that you, you, don't, you do not stand alone. Jesus is with you, and he's standing right beside you. Just like... Those three men who got thrown into this fiery furnace, God was there. He sent someone to be there with him, and they were unharmed. King Nebuchadnezzar noticed this when they were put to the fire, and the devil sees it too. When you get thrown to the fire, when you get thrown to this world, when it tries to attack you, he's going to see Jesus. That's what he's going to see. If you choose to stand, he's going to see Jesus standing right there. And he won't be able to do a thing. Even... King Nebuchadnezzar and even the devil knows who is God. The most high God is Jesus Christ. And he knows it. Amen. And lastly, we need to choose who we will serve. This is like my conclusion. Um, Sabrina, if you could come back to the camera. Turning to Matthew 6 and 24 again. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one, to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. The last choice I want to talk to you about is the most important choice. And that, it's the most important cho- choice you're going to make in your life. And that is to serve God or not to serve God. It's your choice in the end. And it's the, older, and it is the oldest question in human history. Who will you serve? Who will you serve? Either God or mammon. Those are the only two choices. If we could all stand today. Amen. Amen.
you need to make the choice yourself who you are going to serve. I know I haven't been long tonight. I didn't plan on it. I mean, it's just how it came out. But God put this on my heart. It weighed heavy on me. That we need to make that choice. That we are the only ones who can make that choice. Our family can't make it. Our friends can't make it. Your parents can't make it. No one can make it except you. And it is our duty. And will you choose to lead the people to Jesus? Will you choose to stand for Jesus? And will you choose to serve Jesus today? you would make your way up to this altar today and just to put up your hands and just talk to God and tell him your choice because he wants to know your choice today what do you want to do who you want to serve it is your choice amen Jesus is here today